Welcome to the Journey of the Universe 10 Years Later podcast. My name is Sam King, and I'm lucky today to be joined by Teokasin Ghost Horse. Teokasin is, is of the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation of South Dakota. He is an author and an international speaker on peace, indigeneity, and perspectives from Mother Earth. He is a survivor of the Reign of Terror from 1972 to 1976 on the Pine Ridge, Cheyenne River, and Rosebud Lakota Reservations in South Dakota, and the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs Boarding and Church Missionary School Systems designed to, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, unquote, informing Teokasin's long history of indigenous activism and advocacy. He spoke as a 15-year-old at the United Nations in Lake Geneva, Switzerland. He is now a board member of Simply Smiles and Restorative Practices Alliance. Teokasin speaks frequently on the cosmology of indigenous peoples, focusing on the relational egalitarian ethics of indigenous peoples in distinction to rational hierarchical thinking processes in Western culture. Teokasin was a 2016 nominee for a Nobel Peace Prize from the International Institute of Peace Studies and Global Philosophy. He was also selected for the 2016 Native Arts and Cultures Foundation National Fellowship in Music and was a nominee for the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship in 2017, as well as the National Native American Hall of Fame in 2018 and 2019. He was recently named a nominee for the 2020 Americans of the Arts Johnson Fellowship for Artists Transforming Communities and the 2019 Indigenous Music Award nominee for Best Instrumental Album for From the Continuum. He was also awarded New York City's Peacemaker of the Year in 2013. Teokasin is the founder, host, and executive producer of the 30-year-old award-winning First Voices Radio, formerly First Voices Indigenous Radio, a weekly one-hour live program syndicated to over 100 public community, and commercial radio stations in the U.S. and Canada. Thank you, Teokasin, for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Samuel, for inviting me. It's good to be here. Absolutely. I'd like to start off by just asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, my background is blurry right now. Um, let me see what else. Uh, that's in time, it disappears, your memories fade. Mm. Um, we think we're going to remember everything, but I think one thing for sure, just to be part of the introducing myself is that the mm. earth doesn't forget me. So that mm. means the relations of, of who we are with is at the present time is the same relationship I have with my human family, my biological parents, my biological brothers, that biological relationship I had with the, with the food the earth, uh, the water, the air, the rocks, all that intelligence that gave birth to me, creation to me from that place. Um, and the background of <clears throat> that allowing me to express myself in this language as well as another language and to be able to travel um, worldwide, but always making sure that the message is bigger than I am, the, the message of earth, not the message of the human. And I think one thing to be communicate is the where I come from is the Black Hills of the Chesapa, which is the central geographic center of of North America, Turtle Island, as we call it. And the historical context is we have been there from time immemorial, regardless of who brought theories to where we come from or originate. Um, so the background that I have comes with all of those uh, ancestors, as well as uh, um, people will, we will actually descendants, we will leave uh, and always be with as our memory dictates that there is no disconnection. So the background comes with all of those zillions, gazillions of ideas. And I think that we all arrive at this point to really try to communicate that. And today is that time. Thank you for your powerful words. And I'm struck by the ways in which different elements of the earth and this relational web sort of comes through in the way you're introducing yourself. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about Lakota cosmology and how 
your connection to the broader universe informs your life and work? Um, well, Wak Ching Sape is, sape is um, Wak Ching Sape is consciousness. Mm. Um, to be aware of that, um, you must introduce yourself and know yourself in the sense of being from that same consciousness and what gives us consciousness. Um, <clears throat> the um, Where I live right now is near a place called Cairo, New York, which is 12 mm. miles north of where I live in that consciousness to me that has brought me in this place is took a few years to understand this, uh, Sam, but it's the oldest tree root system in the world as far as it's been discovered. And it, it, you can see it from a satellite. You can see it uh, in a quarry that it was uncovered. And this is the oldest tree root system in the world. It's the oldest remains fossilized of the world. And um, they've dated back to maybe billions of years ago. Um, and they also, I live a few hundred miles, at least four or five hundred miles north of a possibly the oldest river in the world. And it's called the New River. And so when we say that we all come from one continent and another, uh, that's not holding true to this day because it's based on speculation, which is science. So when I think about consciousness, I have to think about who holds us in consciousness, but those entities that have been here for so long and that they haven't forgotten us. So they still promote life within us and make sure that our words are true to, to them rather than to some speculative science or religion or so-called consciousness that we can barely come up with and consider as mystery. So in that way, we'll watch Sape in the Lakota language is about consciousness. It's about the universe and that it's, um, <clears throat> it's never outside of us. It's always inside as well, but without the, those dividing words of outside and inside, I get that. But we, we leave the cause and effect mentality of division and know that it's all in relationship rather than connection. So I know it kind of like has the same original base word etymology, but relationship is a moving, is a moving mm, mm, verb, relating. Um, we can say connecting, but we're always looking for connecting or connection. And when we're, relate, we're relating, that's what we are doing. We are relating now, we're not just connecting. That's, uh, we can disconnect technology, but you and I will go on and what we thought about that will continue without an iPhone or without the computer, you will talk about, you will think about, oh yeah, Tioxin said this, and I will think Sam asked this question, you know, and then down the road we'll meet each other and we'll we'll instantly come back to this moment. You know, so these things are are never old or never new. But because of the language, I have to speak in this context of of this connection. So when I'm thinking in consciousness about the cosmos cosmology is where we come from in that greater sense that is has never left the consciousness we have never left the consciousness behind in other words to keep earth um the earth river earth waters the earth's land the food the air all of this clean is our responsibility as native people and because that's the consciousness that communicates with all the other brothers and sisters of this planet called Earth. Um, but now we have been living as <laughs> we have been, we have been, there are humans who live on a planet as if they live on a different planet, mm -hmm. you see? And it's not the consciousness here because it seems to be divided into ownership and domination. So the consciousness that I would say is without domination because you cannot be conscious if your your foot is on top of somebody else, especially if it's on top of the earth and trying to dominate the earth. There is no consciousness within that. So it's, uh, to me, the letting go of that property, that proprietorship, even the stewardship that is often used by environmentalists. Even environmentalists is, is too much a small of a container so, somewhat. And so the viewpoint that I'm I'm saying is that it seems to me that when I was educated within the Western world, that was about um, 
Europe, Asia, and Africa. And it was later on, it was a tidbit or a, a little bit about native people and it's still that way. So nothing has really been rethought. In other words, the rethinking about consciousness is only coming from those ideas of Pythagoras and the, 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 the Greeks and Romans basically, and has carried over onto this country called America. And so the temporality that has been here, it seems to be showing signs of disengagement and it's in a, it's in a disarray, it's in confusion about trying to understand its place on the land as, as much as we do as native people understand our place with the land. So in the consciousness of the land, we say that the rocks, the earth, the water, the fire, all these have consciousness because they have, they put us together. They uh, live within us. And the understanding is uh, we don't go outside of that box framework. Uh, we, we kind of extract outside to bring back into the side so we can understand why we are here. And that question is, why are we here? And so when I think about consciousness, I'm thinking, what would the rocks say? What would the trees say? What would the water say? What would, you know, fire say? What would the wind say? So where are the languages to speak to those consciousnesses, those intelligences that make us up? You see, mm -hmm. when did we cut that off in this language? Because mm -hmm. definitely the old traditional languages that I know indigenous peoples have not cut that off yet, but that's fast coming if we don't, if, if we're not supported in our resilience to this half-witted consciousness of science, religion, and sort of dogmatic, um, authoritarian, you know, it, it all, it's all standardized and they go to a defaulted to the Western way of how to see things like all humans are supposed to think this way, which is not true. Wow, you've touched on so many uh, subjects, Teokasen, and I'm struck by your critiques of Western science and rationalism and some of the dualistic thinking sometimes embedded in the scientific process. And I'm curious to draw you out a little bit on this relationship between uh, modern science and indigenous life ways, particularly considering that the Journey of the Universe project is trying to weave together modern scientific accounts of the, the universe with humanistic insights deriving in large part on indigenous wisdom and the narrator of the Journey of the Universe film himself, Ryan Swim, is descended from the Salish people in the Pacific Northwest. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about how you um, understand that relationship between traditional Lakota and other indigenous lifeways and modern scientific accounts of cosmic origins. That's a great question. Thank you. In fact, I'm doing one um, in, in a sort of a relational um, talk I'm giving this in a few days about land acknowledgement. Mm. <clears throat> and part of that is a, is a conversing with several elders um, in their 80s <laughs> and you know retired professors, scholars, and talking with them, they're, they kind of laugh at land acknowledgement because it's more performative. Kind of laugh at those who say they are indigenous without ever living indigenous. And so it's performative. We, 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 we look for, you know, what are they performing and who are they performing for? And so you go deeper than that. It's nice that it's a footnote that, that I live right now in the Catskills and the, the Muncie people, uh, it's their land, it's their acknowledgement, but where are they? Where are native people? Even so to say that it's been, we've been put at one time, we were American Indians, Native Americans, Indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nations. Um, and then all of a sudden it disappeared and we were included in BIPOC, you know, the bipolitical terminology, BIPOC. And that means that, okay, our culture is disappearing because what, what, are, what was the BIPOC without the Indigenous in that? It was a political nature um, nuanced by the, the current trend of, well, well, we'll let you be part of this uh, political trend or whatever that is, and equality. But yet it was a gentrification phrase to me 
And so now indigenous peoples are lumped into that because that means we're losing culture. And so when we're tied into to culture, it's very much different. The lived experience, not the experimented, experimenting of science, you see. And so when I hear that they we're looking at earth as if it was a pro progress of science, and yet we seem to be winding up not in the same place, even the worst condition about learning to how to live with the earth. We're still living on the earth as if we dominated, and this is our progress. And this is how we become human. Uh, <clears throat> and I always wonder, because if we look at the, the old uh, indigenous peoples, the ancient civilizations, um, usually uh, European, not the 100,000 year old cultures that have been here sustaining. We tend to go to the three or four or 5,000 year old way of looking at life, but even that is seen through the modern context in the language of modernity. But yet it seems like we're developing a language of hospicing this modernity. So we're hospicing by talking about extraction, we're talking about, um, uh, what am I saying here? You know, extraction, extinction, even to go as far as saying uh, hope, you know, um, without ever understanding the origin of that myth or that story um, and the language of salvation point mentality that we can save the earth and we can save the indigenous cultures, um, but it's stymied by this colonial um, expansion extraction and progress ideas mm. um and so when when we hear that as traditional the elders hear that as traditional people they're saying okay well here's science it has dogma and authority it looks to authority as the authority here's religion as authority and here's government so all three of these have an authority in the in the modern context yet you go among the nations there is no authority because you have to learn how to relate to everything in relationship speak their languages understand their languages teach learn their lessons that we're always learning and so they're not coming in dogmatic form they're coming in how they get together and how they grow amongst each other and with each other and sometimes there's balance and out of balance um and so for me not coming from a traumatic creation story. Uh, Big Bang is not, it's not, it was so soft and beautiful how we came here into consciousness, but it was not a Big Bang. So I, as I see that things have changed, even science has changed along the way, but what has changed that science, Sam, is Earth. The Earth has always changed science and we're always one or two steps out of rhythm with mm. the earth mm. so who is in rhythm with the earth but indigenous peoples are at least we're closer mm. but also we aren't the ones here to save the earth and i think we have to understand that we cannot do that especially with science which has divided dissected the earth up to prove some point um, that we are intelligent beings and yet we're not really the results or the consequences aren't that we're, in we're not any more intelligent than then, you know, I don't know, I guess ourselves, we're too much, we, we're, we're amazed by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have been, become narcissistic and think that we can overcome our own problems without the earth, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know if that suffices for, for an answer to the problem, but I think along, you know, the lines of, of the video journey of the earth, uh, journey of the universe is that was 10 years ago. Now, I bet you the, the video that will be coming, uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking there will be, that that will include a mu much more conscious-based, earth-based um, practicality mm. and not so westernized in a bit because that was to for some people, uh, but now it's an explosion of, see, here's a, the violent language. It's an explosion of consciousness now but it's more about the earth rather than of a science. Mm. Um, science takes money. Mm. Um, the earth gives freely 
never charges for water, fire, uh, food. The earth doesn't charge us, but mm. here's what science does mm. in order to, to that we are always paying for science. Um, so it sounds critical. It maybe it is to a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I think it'll, we need to um, um, really understand that all humanity didn't do and won't do what the Western world has said for everybody should be doing. And all humanity is uh, science of speculation, we could say, which is a myth, which is almost superstitious. But that's the word or, or, or we don't have in, in, our, in a lot of indigenous languages is the word for superstitious because we're living the practical mystery in a sense. Mystery is not superstitious. But to me, science is trying to, to crack the code, so to speak, of mystery. And yet the other peoples are uh, accepting the code, accepting that we can never ever solve the mystery. So we accept mystery and we don't use it as if um, we were ignorant or intelligent or intelligent. I think we're, we're understanding that the intuition is the greatest language we know that takes care of the instincts that divide us up. So it, it's the language of intuition. My mother would say, um, uh, we cannot speak Lakota without intuition. And therefore, all life speaks of this intuition, speaks of the consciousness, and life is not making a movie. Mm -hmm. Life is is being the movie, in a mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and speaking of that idea of being a movie or letting your life be an artistic uh, outpouring of creativity emerging from larger earth and the cosmos. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your, your flute playing. And I know you're award-winning musician and I'm curious how your artistry has drawn on these cosmological perspectives that you're bringing. Well, I think CEO Tonka, the best that I can, well, even talking to other Lakota flute players is um, the, here's how I'd like to simplify it in, in a bit. And I ask, excuse me, um, and I ask um, young children this, I'm saying, what is the first instrument in the world? And people are looking around and they're saying, drum? Even adults, drum? Um, and it's like, that's true, that's true. And then, okay, what is the second instrument? And they, they say, well, a guitar or, you know, flute, flute, yeah, flute. But we say, no, it's, it's really that same instrument that we hear in mother's womb when the mother talks in high voices to the baby. We've all seen that and witnessed it and heard it, that the mother goes in a higher pitch, maybe, mm -mm, how do you say, sinking with that, that life that's growing within her. And she sings. So this is that high-pitched flute. And so we say siotanka, which is more or less um, the big the big voice of the universe. Because even Pythagoras, in what he said was, I think it was Pythagoras, he said that um, all matter is, musely, is, is merely music solidified. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if everything is, is music, then... Where is the language to hear it? We all know music innately from that time uh, of when our, bir our, our birth, birthing process started within our mother. Um, so to bring it all into harmony is to understand that all life sings the same song, the same vibration, um, and has the same colors, so to speak. So now this sounds like, okay, we can't capture what Tilka is saying. Uh, maybe we don't need to do that anymore. We need to let go of the ideas, thinking that we control, control, where do we come from, right? Maybe Black Elk said, the center of the universe is, every, is everywhere. So where is that? You know, there, where is the need? 
uh, the addiction to control. Maybe that's what the question we should be. Why do we need to control mm. information and knowledge and information and knowledge so much? We have so much of it now. We don't know what to do with it. So mm. we speculate. We, mm. we employ theory. Um, we pay for it. Um, so, and, and the elder that I interviewed a few weeks ago said that we have, we, at the same time, <laughs> we are um, starving for wisdom. Mm. you know and that's what we're missing and and like okay well if that elder that i interviewed is 88 years old turning 89 this this month then how long ago was it that he spoke with an elder that was born in the mid 1800s you know or even his grandfather who was born way back in early 1800s what what where is that relationship, that in, that um, intergenerational quantum relationship that continues? So when we think think about the relationship of the flute, that goes back to all of our cultures, if that's what it is, if we still have a culture. And that's the second instrument beside the drum, which is the heartbeat in the world. So we all have flutes, we all have drums no matter where we come from. So it's not an old idea or a new idea. It's just an idea that has become practical. When we whistle, when we sing, that's the same idea as a flute. But in this case, because it's it's played through the instrument of the cedar, red cedar, uh, it's bringing out these ideas that was implanted before I, any of us were ever here as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, okay, I have my flutes here. I live closest to the, the oldest root system in the world, which is in Cairo, New York. Um, and so there's the reason why I'm being drawn here, maybe. And I can like do a Harry Potter on myself or just accept. But these are energies that we're just not recognizing and they're coming back up. And we understand that the consciousness of water through standing rock, through like now I know that the oldest river is possibly in the new river. Um, I think it's the Tennessee, Virginia, North Carolina border. I'm pretty sure something like that. Um, mm. Or Virginia. Um, yeah. Um, and it, it goes into the Potomac. Right. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, these are the waters and this is the trees and they both have having to do with the water. And here is the flute between those and, and it's not that I'm a, a, a soothsayer or someone special. It's just that I've been given to play the flute since I was very young. And I never play with rigidity. It's always what comes from the energy that's present. So mm -hmm. I think that's, I don't read music mm -hmm. in a sense. So yeah, I think that's, that, that's about the flute. I can talk about the flute all day, yeah. Beautiful. And I've enjoyed listening to your, your music as well. And uh, yeah, it, it's really incredibly soothing and, and grounding. So thank you for sharing your gifts with us all. Um, and you've touched a little bit on the idea of education and this critique of rationalized and even, you know, overly scientific ways of knowing. And I'm curious, how you envision the future of education. I've had a chance to speak with a few other folks interested in integral ecology and environmental education. And I'm curious to hear your perspective on the direction that education needs to go to um, orient younger generations to a mutually enhancing relationship with the earth. Well, I'm as usual, Sam, I'm going to go around to come to a point, mm -hmm. not just boom, linear, right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll use, try to use what little knowledge I have from the West and, and combine it with uh, the modern day. Well, see, this is the modern day and that's the primitive. I don't, I don't like that at all. That's a division. We were there 100,000 years ago observing the stars as much as anybody else. Mm. You know, uh, we just didn't have to build, build machines to know that because mm. at those times we were able to. The Kogi know that. A lot of ancient cultures 
know this. I've been to Australia, been down deep with the native people there that they don't allow anybody but native people, you know, and yet uh, we, we tend to take the Western ideas of education because it's dealing with information and digging it out and inf knowledge and then we make books out of it and therefore it must be that we know mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of native people remain silent because that can't be translated into education western style but i realized that the etymology of education is also educe or su to seduce right to draw out or lead away from someone says ignorance but why does it have an ellipsis to draw out or lead away from and when i was looking in my younger years um, for what's the ellipsis for and someone said well there was an old dictionary and if you go into this old dictionary um, before four, uh, 1930 or 1940 that when definitions kept kept changing to get away from nature and consciousness of spirit and that they said, well, to draw out a lead away from spirit mm. and to replace with knowledge and information and who controls knowledge and information, but mm. the authoritarian, the educative, um, you know, the sciences, the religion and the government. Um, mm. So that's where we are establishing, well, this is the way to go. And forget about those indigenous indigenous ideals, because we can't live that in the modern world, because we have the modern conveniences of education, uh, making everything more efficient and better for who, but yes, yet worse for the earth, making the earth poverty, make the earth into a museum, um, and to gawk at animals and to gawk at a, a park. And so we're, we're taking education away, really how we experience living languages, living experiences with those birds and the fish. And, and yeah, and, that, and you realize, Sam, that requires no education, that requires experience, that requires no thinking, that, that doesn't require, I think, therefore, I am, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, mm -hmm. that requires we think, therefore, we are. Mm -hmm. So we're always in appreciation, because we don't have to think. Uh, what could be worse than trying to go to heaven or making ourselves so heavenly that we're no earthly good? Mm. Maybe it's, it's our, our, our mentality or maybe it's our purpose is to learn how to live with the earth then, mm. and not have the education, um, not have, um, um, how do I say this, not have the wisdom educated out of ourselves. You see, mm -hmm. because that that goes with how many degrees do you have mm -hmm. saying, well, I have this now and I'm I am in a, an establishment that says I am I know more and mm -hmm. I have these merit merit meritorious honors. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that person sitting on in a jungle knows less. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe so. But I'm telling you that we're going to need wisdom. Mm -hmm. not knowledge and information to get through what the earth is about to present to us, mm -hmm. you know, wisdom about getting through it, um, how it's, it's going to be required, mm -hmm. you know, cause mm -hmm. it's not, we can't measure poverty <laughs> really. Um, we've made indigenous peoples poor. We've made the earth, the animals have animal poverty because they can't go to where they need to go now. Migratory routes are stopped. They're, they can't drink the same water. Uh, they can't fly here and there because we have this progress of science everywhere, technology, and they're getting killed. And how many, because of our presence as human beings in this manner, can they continue to live without land, without replenishing the land and restoring the land as they have for who knows beyond time? So maybe it's understanding these colonial processes that are allowed to run rampant without breaks that is going to stop. But you see, I'm, I'm in a different mindset that Earth will take care of, of us as well as the, the re relatives, the relationship. Um, because she does this automatically anyway. She culls 
Coles, C U L L S, I think, Coles, that domination. Mm. And if there's too many deer, well, she calls it back. If there's too much of greed, there's too much of humans, we'll be called back, even if it's at our own doing. Mm. You know, mm. I think we've become too anthropocentric. Mm -hmm. Even I have about applying, well, this is how human beings are going to uh, survive. Uh, but when it comes to actuating what I'm saying, we need to understand and listen to those voices we never have and stop dismissing them in a political context, in an educative context, in a government, any kind of context that comes from Greece. Mm. Yeah. And, and because that, that context and the consciousness is much bigger than, than the loud voice that comes out of Greece or Greek. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the education process is, um, it's good for what it is to make the money, to have the privilege and advancement within the system that's getting smaller and smaller all the time. And we're getting more intellectual and not understanding what intelligence is and intelligence is that you don't have to think mm. you use more of your intuition and mm. that's intuition having to deal with appreciation. And that's the, the highest form of intelligence. Mm. Yeah. Well, powerfully said, Tiogason. And I, I know that we have viewers from around the world living in very different bio regions from very different backgrounds and very conscious of the problems of cultural appropriation or appropriating indigenous culture, life ways from, from different cultural vantage points. But to sort of conclude here, I'm curious, what parting words would you have for our viewers in trying to embody this more intuitive experience in harmony with the earth? You know, what message would you share with us at this particular ecological and historical moment? Wow, that, that's wide open. <laughs> um, does Mother Earth have a public relations firm besides what we have formed out of that education process that we described? Who, ha who can go to the Earth and teach Earth a lesson? Who can not say that the Earth lies? Where are these languages that don't lie? Where are these languages that have relational values to the earth and all life that speak the languages of the earth that are not anthropocentric? So maybe when we go to a tree and understanding the etymology of culture, where we come from as humans, who have learned, have learned how not to be, or we're no longer the beings of earth, or just earthlings, we're just thinking that we, we can outsmart the earth, and that we're not in rhythm. So all of these are, are questions, and yet we, we tend to think that we could go back to the drawing board and make something new. And yet, maybe the answer is that the earth is because he's always changing and being old at the same time. Uh, the apocalypse is something to us, meaning revealing the truth rather than the end. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will be the end of a, of a world that is uh, a way to live, but it will not be the end of the earth. Because somehow, as, as we say, it's that we transmit her energy. And mm. later on, we can transform. But right now, we're looking to transform so that we don't, you know, do any more harm to the earth. No, it's, it's uh, you know, current situations, uh, original languages do not have certain concepts. One being not, uh, we don't have a concept of domination or the word for it. So everything that I'm speaking to you seems to be coming from domination. Yet it's the language I'm using but that is, it feels and sounds like a weapon. Uh, and we have to stop the war against the earth and learn how to have peace with the earth. Um, give credit to where it's due, 
and maybe the quantum physics of these languages and the inflection, the, the harmony, the, the sound, the, the vibrations of these languages is actually the science that we need to put ourselves back in rhythm with the earth, you see. And so I will leave that open and maybe people who want to find answers will find it, but it's about compelling us to recognize a continuum, not a beginning or an ending. So for me, there was no big bang. I think we suffer the consequences of that theory of trauma because we want to own that theory, which never will be um, as much as I can only explain it in that language that our creation story, which had no beginning, that we are continuing to create or be part of that creation story. Mm. So, and uh, we can't control whether or not we progress or not, that's not up to us. But it feels freer letting go of all these ownership thoughts. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Teokasen, for sharing your wisdom with us all and for all the activism and advocacy you're doing on behalf of Indigenous peoples around the world. Um, I'm deeply inspired by your life and the, your mission and I'm wishing well to you and to all of your relations. Thank you very much, Samuel, for, for being here and yeah, being brave, you know, that, that's good. Um, I think we all have to be that and, and maybe we'll all meet up someday and we'll, we'll like, whoa, we were good, weren't we? We were good. We were good thinking about this stuff. We were good and knowing mm -hmm. that there is, is this balance of always a balance, not the wrong and the right not the do's and the don'ts, but always the balance that we need to strive for. Mm. So yeah, and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.